If it is your first time here, we've been in this series, The Movement, now for 13 weeks. And I kind of want to give you like a 30,000 view of where we've been at and what we've covered over the last few weeks. Some of the things that we've talked about were the fact that there would be false teachings and false prophets that could creep their way into church. We learned that grace is what drives the movement. Uh, We learned that we should be people who are always praying for everyone, even our leaders, because in the church, there is a leadership structure. Um, You know, Paul talks about um, deacons and elders, what we would call here our uh, overseer, overseers and te- our servant leaders. And then um, he goes in and he talks about the fact that there are going to be some false uh, teachers that are going to say, hey, here's some urban legends, here's some myths, and they're going to creep their way into the church, and it's going to draw people away from following the Lord. And Paul, like we learned last week, was telling Timothy, it's good to be physically healthy, but you need to be spiritually fit as well. And so we're going to come to a section of verses that would be very easy for us just to dismiss. Because at first glance, as we look at these verses, we could say, well, this is just for the pastor. That's what this is for. It doesn't apply to me. And so you kind of zone out. And you would be right in thinking that it is for the pastor. That is an application to these set of verses. But there is another application, and it's to all of us here today. I believe that everything Paul is telling Timothy is true for all of us who call ourselves Christians, for all of us who call ourselves believers. And my hope and prayer has been leading up to this message is that this will bring you some encouragement and joy like I think Paul is trying to do, and it'll apply to you wherever you're at in your walk with the Lord. And I kind of think here that, um, before we read this here, that Pastor Paul kind of turns into Coach Paul. And I'm gonna explain myself here in just a minute, but let's read these verses In 1 Timothy 4, verse 11, it says, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Verse 15, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. We come to a section of verses, like I said, where I feel like Pastor Paul is turning into Coach Paul. I feel like Timothy, he's kind of in the fourth quarter of his ministry right now. He's kind of like, I'm getting a little tired here. You know, he's probably getting a little winded. He's dealing with a lot of problems in the church. He's got a lot of wisdom coming at him from Paul. And he's like, I'm tired of this. Take me out, coach. I don't want to play anymore. I'm kind of through with this. And I think Paul is kind of sensing this. And that's why he turns from Pastor Paul to Coach Paul. And I've titled my message, Stay in the Game, because I think that's what he's trying to get at with Timothy, is to stay in the game. I don't know if you ever played sports growing up. I did. Um, I played soccer. I played track and field. I played basketball when I was in high school. And so um, I had a lot of good coaches, and I had some okay coaches as well. And oftentimes there, there would be times when I would be playing. I was like, just take me out. I'm done. I'm tired. And they would keep me in the game. They're like, stay in the game, Wittick. You got this. I don't know if you've ever played sports before. Maybe they, uh, you've had coaches who have been really good coaches who have spurred you on. Recently, the tables kind of turned a little bit for me. Um, My two oldest boys, Brody and Asher, they wanted to play basketball this last winter. And so we signed them up for it. And the coach goes, hey, this is an age group of five, six, seven-year-olds. I'm going to need a little help. Does anybody want to be the assistant coach? And I was like, well, I don't mean to humble brag here, but I mean, I did play varsity basketball all four years and, uh, you know, was kind of a big deal uh, in my school. So, you know, I'll do this. And so uh, I signed up to be the assistant coach and I knew there would be a learning curve, but I didn't know how much of a learning curve there would be. There were about three kids that knew what basketball was, and the others were practicing their Fortnite dances, and they were, uh, they were throwing the ball at each other's heads, and they were trying to get each other in headlocks. That was the team that we had. And I was like, oh, man, this, this team needs more than just prayer. Like, this is going to need an anointing here. So I get there. And we've lost the first three games, as you might expect. Like, we had no hope. And the kids were starting to get super discouraged. They were down on themselves. They were like, what's going on? Why are we showing up anymore? I'm like, well, because your parents want you to. But they don't want to play anymore. They're kind of sick of it. They just want to sit on the bench. And I realized they're making progress. They're not seeing their progress, but they're making some progress. 
And so I thought, you know what? Let me just encourage them. Let, the, let me show them the progress they're making. So if they shot the ball at the right goal and they actually did try to shoot the ball, then I was like, good job. You shot the ball. Good job. Keep doing that. You know, if they were running around, I was like, good job. Good hustle. Keep going. If they're playing defense, good job trying to take the ball away. You know, if they were passing or cheering on their team, I was like, way to be an encouragement, way to encourage your team. You know, I was helping them see that they were growing in areas they may not have thought that they were growing in, but I wanted them to see that they were growing. And it turns out that it seemed to kind of work because we lost five games and we won five games. So I think that was kind of a win for our team considering we started off losing three, but we were the best Fortnite dancing um, team out there. So, (laughs) but there are four things that I think um, Paul, Coach Paul is telling Timothy and I think Coach Paul is telling us too to remind us to stay in the game. Four things. And the first thing is this, be bold, be bold. There are two instructions or two orders that Paul is giving to Timothy. It's to command and teach. Paul starts out in a very strong way, in a strong tone to Timothy. He's not like, oh, hey, Timothy, um, can you maybe suggest and talk about, or when you get the right chance, can you kind of beat around the bush or be passive aggressive? Maybe bring these up when it's the right time. He's using military terminology here when he says command and teach these things. It has some force behind it. Timothy is to push himself and teach these things with some energy and some passion and authority, and he needs to do it with tact. And you might be sitting here going, well, what are the things he's supposed to be teaching? What are the things he's supposed to be talking about? Well, Timothy is really supposed to be talking about God in general and, and how God sent his son, Jesus. But he's primarily supposed to be focusing on verse four, that it's easy to let urban legends, it's easy to let myths and other things creep their way into church. And while we may be good physically, we need to be much more uh, phys- uh, spiritually fit than we are physically fit. And so Timothy is to command and teach those things, to help people know who their God is. And you might get the impression from how stern Paul is being here, that Timothy was not that kind of person that Timothy wasn't a very commanding person. The the text kind of suggests that Timothy is rather timid. And I think a lot of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, we can identify with this. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, we shy away from being bold. We might feel uncomfortable sharing our faith with others and what Jesus has done in our lives. How easy is it for us to go, hey guys, did you see the latest Avengers movie? Man, and you dissect, you dissect that movie, you're all about it, and then you go, man, I can't wait till Toy Story 4. Uh, I could go watch it, but I hope they better not screw that up because the way 3 ended was a whole lot better than 4. You know, So you're kind of like hoping for that. It's easy for you to talk about the latest, uh, to quote lines from your favorite TV show, The Office, and you get them in all the time. You know, it's how easy for us to quote movies or talk pop culture and say, who's the greatest athlete of all time, Michael Jordan. And how easy is it for us? You can hate me all you want, all right? I'm old school. Remember, I have credibility. I played, I was a big deal in Albuquerque, New Mexico. All right, so, uh, (laughs) just kidding. I really wasn't, but I was. So that's why I married Jen. She was like, look at that athlete, woo-hoo. And I was like, yep, that's right. So that's how I got Jen, in case you were wondering. So. Anyways, how easy is it for us to talk about pop culture and talk about all those things, but how much more difficult is it for us to shy away and not be bold when it comes to the things of Jesus, how Jesus changed our life, the thing that Jesus is showing us in our lives, how he's changed us and how we have a hope and a future because of Jesus. How much harder is it for us? And so we shy away from that. We're not as bold. And Paul is telling Timothy here, you need to tell the people about truth. You need to be bold in telling, Jesus, telling your people about Jesus. So then Paul goes from kind of commanding Timothy to kind of encouraging him in verse 12. And if you've been around the church for any length of time, you'll know this verse. Or maybe you were in ministry as a kid and this was your life verse, but it goes like this. Let no one despise you for your youth. And this is the second thing we can learn from Coach Paul is set the example. Now, we don't know how young Timothy really was, probably not as young as we might think by the indication of this verse. Um, If I took a poll here in the North venue or South venue, you might get the, you might have your own opinion of what youthfulness is. Some of you might say five, some of you might say 10, 15, someone in their 20s. But that word youthful means uh, someone in their 30s or 40s, or even I read some places, someone as early as in their 50s. And so if you're in that age bracket or you're nearing that age bracket and it just hurts getting out of bed sometimes, you're like, I'm not as young as I used to be. 
Yes, you are. This is now your new life verse. You're welcome for that. I'm glad you came to church. You are youthful. But think about this. Timothy is taking over for Paul. Paul planted this church in Ephesus. He didn't want to leave this church high and dry. So he leaves Timothy in charge. And there would have been a lot of people who would have been under Paul's ministry for a long time. And there would be people who would have this tendency just to dismiss Timothy as lacking authority or lacking experience because he was young. But even if Timothy did everything right, I'm sure he would still hear this. He's no Paul. Paul taught better than this. Paul was funnier. Paul read better. Paul was a better speaker. Paul was a better counselor. Paul did this. Paul did that. Paul, Paul, Paul. Timothy would have never measured up to Paul. And Paul doesn't tell Timothy, hey, you need to rebuke these people. You need to stand up to them and put them in their place. Paul doesn't tell him to do any of that. Paul's like, don't be discouraged by what people think or say, and don't be offended either if people think you're too young. Instead, Paul tells him to answer his haters with a model life, to set an example for everyone. Maybe you felt like that before. Maybe you felt you were too young or inexperienced for that job promotion or that, that dream job of yours, and so you never put in an application. Or maybe for you, you hear us, we're up here, and we're like, hey, we want to reach more people for Jesus, and the only way to do that is we need more people. And you're like, well, I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I don't know my Bible well enough. You see, let me remind you, God often uses those who are young in age and often young in experience. I'm reminded in the Old Testament, the story of David and Goliath. Here's this guy, Goliath. He's in the Philistine army. The Philistines and the Israelites, they're at war with one another. And Goliath comes out for 40 days in his booming voice. He's taunting the Israelites and he's kind of acting like his own Dana White of the UFC trying to get his own octagon uh, death match going on here. He's like, come on, I'm the best Philistine warrior. Israel, who you got? Let's go here. And Israel, you know, they're all cowering in fear. They're like, ah, I don't know what to do here. We don't, we don't have really that. No one wants to really face, face Goliath. And little did they know that here's this boy, David. He's running an errand for his dad and his brothers are on the front line. And David's talking to his brothers and he's like, what's, he hears Goliath come out in his booming voice and he's like, who's this guy? What's this joker talking about up here? And they fill him in. They let David know what's going on. And David's like, well, hold on. So he goes back and he talks to King Saul and he's like, hey, I'll step up. I'll fight this guy. And King Saul's like, well, no one else is volunteering, so go for it. And so he gives him all of his armor. And I like to think like the sword's a little too heavy for David. The helmet's probably fallen off his head a little bit. And he's like, this isn't how I fight. I don't, I've, never been in, I've never been in an army. I've never fought any battles. So he takes off all the armor and he goes, the Lord, I'm gonna come in the name of the Lord with my slingshot and some stones and I'm gonna take this guy out. So he swings the slingshot and the stone goes right in Goliath's head and he dies. I'm also reminded in the New Testament, Jesus is preaching to over 5,000 people and he's going, you know what? I'm getting a little hungry, uh, disciples. Let's feed all these people because I'm sure they're hungry too. And the disciples are probably like, um, Jesus, uh, I, we don't have the budget for this. Like, um, I don't know how we're going to do this. And I don't think Domino's delivers this far out. So we've got a little bit of a problem here. And this boy steps out of the crowd and he goes, hey, Jesus, I've got the uh, Lunchable here. I've got some fish and some bread here. Can, you, can this help? And Jesus takes this kid's fish and bread and he blesses it. And he feeds over 5,000 people. And they had so much food that they had baskets of leftovers. The point to those two stories is this. Sometimes we forget that God can do amazing things with just a little bit to work with. You might think and look at what you have and go, well, I, all I have is blank. I don't know how God can use this. All I have is a smile. God can use that. He can use that in your workplace. He can use that um, at your house. He can use that in, at Awaken as well. We need people on our VIP 10, our social teams. We could need people who could use that gift to bless other people. You might think, well, I'm really kind of tech savvy. I really like to play around with electronics and things. I'm a fast learner. Well, great. Guess what? We could use that here as well. We have lots of tech. You might go, well, I'm handy. I know how to build things or I'm creative. Well, guess what? Sometimes God's house is kind of falling apart and we need some help. We need some people who have that skill. God can use that. But I think a lot of times we have all these excuses why we can't be used by the Lord. All David had in his hands was a slingshot and some stones, yet God used it to deliver the Israelites. 
All this boy had was a Lunchable and God used it and blessed it to feed thousands of people. God can use whatever you have, no matter how young or inexperienced you feel and no matter how you view whatever God has given you, he can use it. But I think sometimes we're like Timothy where we're too young or too inexperienced to be used by God. And I think what Paul's getting at here is he's like, you know what, Timothy, stop hiding behind the excuses. Stay in the game. Even though you feel young, you need to stay in the game. And Paul could tell him to do that because that's exactly what Paul did. Paul was a man who lived as an example to others. In fact, in Philippians 3.17, Paul says this, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul's life fit his teaching. I don't mean to say that Paul never contradicted himself or that Paul lived some sinless life and he's like, guys, I got this all figured out, follow me. There's only been one who's lived a sinless life here on, his, on earth and his name was Jesus. So Paul's not saying, follow me because I got this all figured out, but his life showed consistency. So Paul is advising Timothy to offset criticism, not by criticizing his critics and not by lashing out at them. He's to take criticism away from them by living a life that's above their criticism. And how is he to do that? He's young, he's inexperienced. How is he to live a life? How is he to set the example? Well, the end of verse 12 tells us, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. So let's look at these real quick. The first one being speech. That could be a convicting one for many of us because I think at some level, we all struggle with our words. James 3 tells us the tongue is a great member that can do great damage or great good. So when you look at your life and the words you say, how is your speech? What do the things you say show about who you are? Are you a flippant kind of person saying whatever comes to your mind? Especially when you're on Wilma Rudolph on a Friday night where apparently the whole city wants to go hang out. And those lights are not timed right either. And so apparently everybody wants to go to Olive Garden too. And so that right lane is always very backed up. And you're just like, come on. And so you start cussing out at the Olive Garden. You're cussing out at the drivers. You're cussing the lights out. Or, or if your kids, they start acting up and you get caught up in the emotions of a moment and a reckless word comes out. Or you and your spouse, you're disagreeing about some things and you said some things you wish you wouldn't have said. See, I think all too often, we, uh, we rip into one another with our reckless words or our speech. And then we don't go to one another when we sin against each other and ask for forgiveness. So we need to control our tongues. We need to be better at that. And it could be a hard thing to do. Our words and our speech are important. After all, God created the universe with his words. He spoke and things were created. And God created us to be verbal beings as well. But just like food, sex, money, if our words are allowed to run wild without restraint, or if there are no boundaries, or if our words are used in abusive ways, they can be deadly. So my challenge to you this week is maybe you need to give some life-giving words to someone you know. Maybe your spouse or uh, your kids or maybe somebody in your family, maybe a coworker, a friend. Maybe you just need to tell them, I love you, you're the best, I'm proud of you. See, our words and our speech, we need to build people up. We need to, our words and our speech need to be filled with love, joy, kindness, gratefulness, appreciation. So Paul is saying we must set an example in speech. And the next thing is conduct. And this means a matter of life. It's how you live all day, every day. It includes your actions at church, in the grocery store, in your neighborhood, school, work, wherever you live, everywhere you live, everywhere you go, our conduct is our behavior in every situation of life. That means that our everyday actions need to match up to God's word. How do we know this? Well, James 1.23 tells us, be doers of the word, not hearers only. So we shouldn't be reading our Bibles throughout the week or coming to church on a Sunday, opening them up, learning how we should live our lives in light of the Bible and then go on Riverside Drive and act a fool. We need to be applying the things of God's word in our lives. Paul is telling us that the way we live and all of our actions matter. We need to be disciplined and careful with what we do, where we go, and what we say. And the third thing Paul hits on is love. That Timothy is to be a man of love. We are to be people of love. Love is a concept promoted by Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, Buddhists, agnostics, atheists, Love is something everybody wants to get every single day. 
Love is something we all know about and we all desire, but so often love is the hardest thing for us to practice. If I were to ask you, how are you at showing love for others, what would you say? Are you seeking the best for others or are you only looking out for numero uno, just yourself? Paul is coaching us here to have love for others. And as Christians, we are to be known for our love. In fact, Jesus said this in John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. But often when the world hears the word Christian, I don't think they think of the word love. I think when the world hears the word Christian, they may think patriotic. They may think rule follower. They may, they may think of somebody who uh, is a stingy or bad tipper on a Sunday after church. They might think of somebody who blindly votes Republican. They might think of somebody who will judge you if you say a four-letter word or you drink a beer. But I don't think when the world hears the word Christian, they think of the word love. And that might not be fair to say because that might not be you. And you won't be able to change what the whole world thinks about Christians when they hear that word Christians, but you can change what people and influence what people around you think of when they hear the word Christians. We have to understand that it's our responsibility to demonstrate the love that was first shown to us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul urges Timothy to be a man of love. And I think he would, be, he would urge us to be people who are known for our love. Not only love inside these walls, we should love people inside Awaken. Whether you like them or not, whether you agree with them or not, we're called to love them. But we're also called to love people outside these walls as well. You know, just in a few weeks, we're gonna have this thing called Serve Day. And this is our opportunity. I think it's July 13th, it's a Saturday. This is our opportunity to share the love of Jesus with our city to show the city that we love the city, that we care for the city, that we're not here to be served, we're here to serve the city. And better yet, we have a better thing, is that Jesus, we get to be the hands and feet of Jesus because Jesus died for the city. Jesus loves the city. Jesus has a hope and a future for the city and we get to be the people to tell the city about Jesus and the hope that we have in Jesus. And so I hope that you can find some time on a Saturday to serve for our serve day. We need to be people not known so much for the things we're against, but for our love. We're also to set an example in faith. Now, this could point to faithfulness or reliability, meaning let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that if something better comes along, you're not like, peace out, I found a better gig, see you guys later. We're faithful to see something through. But this could also point to the faith that we have towards God. So when trials and storms and struggles come into your life, how do you respond? I'm reminded when Job lost everything, his wife just told Job, hey, just curse God and die, which by the way, a bad idea, okay? So don't do that. I hope you don't do that. But who or what do you turn to when trials, struggles, storms come into your life? Do you turn to drugs, alcohol, sex, other relationships? Do you depend on yourself or do you have faith in God? when storms and trials come into your life. You see, it's important how we respond to our struggles. My mom, about four years ago, she died of breast cancer. And about 10 years in October, she would have been diagnosed, diagnosed for the very first time. And never once did she go, why did this happen to me? God, didn't I serve you? Didn't I go to church enough? Didn't I read my Bible enough? Didn't I pray enough? Didn't I give enough? God, this is, I'm going just fine. Why are you letting this come into our family? Why does this have to happen to me? What she said is, why not me? Why can God not use this so that somebody else can hear the good news of Jesus? Why can God not use this in my life so I can tell them the hope that I have in Jesus, whether I'm healed or not, which by the way, she is healed because she's in heaven. Why can God not use this in my life to bless other people? See, too often I think we call ourselves believers, but we are not believing believers, we aren't expecting God to work. We aren't trusting God with our problems. We need to remember that God was faithful to us in our past. He'll be faithful to us in our present struggles. And guess what? You will have future trials. You will have future storms. And here's the secret. God will be with you then as well. We need to be better at living out Romans 8, 28 that says all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say the partial things. It doesn't say the things that you understand. It says all things work together for good 
for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I don't know why my mom had to die. I'm still pretty young. I'm still youthful. I'm still in that 30 to 40 age bracket. I have young kids. It doesn't make sense to me why she had to die, why this had to come into our family. I don't understand it. And I don't know that I ever will this side of heaven. But you know what? One day when I see Jesus face to face, it'll all make sense to me. And I don't want to diminish anyone's struggle or trial or storm that you're going through. I know you might have got that diagnosis you weren't expecting. I understand you might have lost that job or that family member might have died. But you know what? It may not make sense to you this side of heaven. But it will one day, if your hope is in Jesus, that he will work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So we need to set an example in faith. And then finally, Paul hits on purity. This is who we really are. This is moral. Uh, this means moral purity, not just outwardly, but inwardly as well. As soon as a wrong thought pops in your mind or you say a bad word or a lustful thought, whatever it is, you need to confess those thoughts, taking every thought captive. So Paul gives us a five, five ways to set the example. Even if we're young or inexperienced, we have the five ways. Speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. We're to set an example in those areas. And before you go, whoa, all right. You're getting a little sweaty in here. It's a little hot in here, all right? So before you, you know, hold on, pastor guy, you know, just hold on. I get an F minus in all of those things. I'm not, I'm not doing any of this. Don't get Paul's words mixed up here. He's not saying that we have to have all of this perfected in our lives. We have to be growing in this. We have to allow our selfishness to die and allow God to work through us and show himself, himself through us. So we need to set the example. The third thing we can learn from this passage from Coach Paul is use your gift. Verse 13 says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading, to the exhortation, to teaching of scripture. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Here, Paul is reminding Timothy that the word of God is to be the center of the church. And nothing should be allowed to diminish it or take away from it. So Timothy is to read the Bible every Sunday to ensure that it, and to make sure that it happens even long after he's gone. And here we are thousands of years later where the Bible is the center. And this is why we're here and we're reading the scripture aloud today. And I want you to know that Awakened Church will always be about God's word. That God's word will always be the main thing. We will always teach the truth, even though at times it's gonna be like, do we really have to talk about this topic? You know, like it would just be easier for us to pretend like it doesn't exist, but we're not gonna do that here. We're always gonna teach the truth and we're gonna do it in love. God's word will always be the main thing. In fact, you'll hear us say this often or you'll even see it on the walls. It says, God's word defines us. Awakened church is founded on, shaped by, and focused on the exposition of God's word. We believe God's word is alive and active and we're gonna preach it as such regardless of whom it offends. So Paul is telling us and urging us that the Bible should be the most important part of the church. And let me just say this, if you're in the military and you're gonna be PCSing in the next couple of years, when you get to your next city and your next duty station, find a church where God's word is the most important thing. Because if you find a church where God's word is the most important thing, that's gonna be a healthy and thriving church. And let me just dial this into you personally. If you want a healthy life, you have to prioritize God's word above everything else. I know firsthand how easy it is to let little things kind of creep into my life. You know, it's nice and cold or cloudy and rainy out. And I'm like, ah, I just want to pull the covers up over and sleep in a little bit. Or, you know, it's easy to get caught up in work. You're checking those emails. You're making those phone calls. You're busy doing your thing and making sure your work gets done. It's easy for us to allow movies, video games, social media, whatever it is, take the place of God's word. And those things aren't necessarily a bad thing, but they become a bad thing when they they take priority in our lives. So if you want a healthy life, God's word must be first. You have to prioritize it above everything else. Now, the reason why Paul is having to have to remind Timothy to keep God's word the priority is because Timothy's gifting was the teaching of God's word. That's why in verse 14, he says, don't neglect the gift that you have. Timothy was evidently feeling somewhat unsure of himself and calling and the calling and gifting that God had given him. And maybe you felt the same way. 
Maybe you felt unsure of the calling and the gifting that God has given you. Maybe you felt overwhelmed with the gift that God has given you. You're like, I don't even know how to use this. I don't even know what to do with this gift. Let me remind you that Timothy was not being asked to take on a huge task in his own strength. You haven't been asked to take on a huge task in your own strength either. Timothy had a gift, you have a gift. And you have been equipped by God to do what he has asked you to do. So Paul is reminding us that it's our responsibility to use the gift that God has given us. I think Jesus said it best in the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. There's this king and he's gonna go off into a distant land. And before he does, he calls his servants, he calls his employees together and he's like, all right guys, I'm gonna go off into this distant land. I'm gonna come back, but I'm gonna give you some talents. And a talent is like a couple months wager. And so we're talking like in today's money, like millions of dollars that he's gonna give to his employees. And you're like, I wish that was true now. But he tells them, hey, invest this money. Use this money. And when I come back, I'm gonna go away. I'm gonna come back. I wanna get a good return on investment on that. And so the king goes off into this faraway land and the servants go and they start investing the money. The king comes back and he's like, all right, boys, what do we got? What's the return on investment? And the first two, they get a good return on investment. He's like, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate. And he rewards them. The third one, he looks at him and he's like, all right, so what's the return on investment? And the guy's like, well, you know what, king? I, I was afraid of the stock market over here. It's a little up and down. I didn't want to invest in anything bad or evil or anything like that. So this is what I did. I buried it here and he pulls it out of the ground and he's like, here it is, just how you gave it to me. And the king looks at him and he calls him wicked. And here's the point to that story. The king in the story is Jesus. We are the servants. And, there's a t- that and Jesus has gone into heaven, a faraway land, and one day he's coming back for us. But he's given us all a gift And he wants a good return on his investment. And we wanna be like the first two servants where we give a a good return on investment to Jesus with the gift that he's given us. We don't wanna be like the third one where Jesus would call us wicked. And you might think, well, that seems a little harsh. I don't know that Jesus would call me wicked. It's not so much that he did a bad thing. It was he didn't do the right thing with the good thing that God had given him. We need to do the right thing with the good thing that God has given us. The temptation for many of us here is to bury the gift, pretend like it doesn't exist and not use it for whatever reason. But we need to step into the gift. We need to step into our calling that God has given us. If you don't know what your gift is, ask the one who gave the gift. He'll tell you. If you need more confirmation, come talk to a pastor, an overseer, uh, a servant leader, go to our Connect Center. We would love to connect you and help you find the gift that God has given you so you can get a good return on investment. So don't neglect the gift you have. Use what God has given you. And the final thing, and we're told by Coach Paul, is keep our eyes on the prize. He sort of summarizes all that he's been talking about in verses 11 through 14 in this one verse Verse 15, when he says this, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Paul's concluding everything by saying, care about all these things we've just talked about. Care about setting an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Care about reading your Bibles. Care about serving other people. Care about all these things and give yourself fully to these things. When Paul says practice, it means to keep going, to keep working. Paul knows life's gonna get hard. You're gonna wanna quit, but you gotta maintain momentum. You gotta maintain energy. You can't start and stop and start and stop and start and stop like a six-year-old trying to learn clutch for the very first time. You gotta get a little rhythm in your spiritual life. And the way you get there is you have to be diligent. If you want to grow spiritually, you have to be consistent. You have to be diligent in caring about the things of God. We have to continue making forward progress. So look at your Christian life. Examine it. Are you moving forward? Are you standing still? Because you shouldn't be standing still. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be standing still. Are you doing the moonwalk, kind of walking backwards? Because you shouldn't be doing that either. 
You should be making forward progress. You need to be practicing all of these things, caring about all of these things, giving yourself all of to these things and keep practicing it and working it so you can continue to make forward progress. And why is this so important? Verse 16 tells us, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, it's easy to get this verse confused at first glance because at first glance, we might be looking at that going, wait, is this saying like Timothy's the one who does the saving? Timothy is not the one who does the saving. Paul's not the one who does the saving. I don't do the saving. You don't do the saving. There's only one who does the saving and his name is Jesus. Jesus came from heaven to earth to die on a cross, to shed his blood, to break his body for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He was buried in a tomb, but he rose again three days later and he's in heaven. And one day we're gonna see him face to face. So Jesus is the one who does the saving. The other way to get this mixed up is to go, well, is this saying that we're saved by works? Ephesians 2 tells us that we're saved by grace through faith, not from works. So it's not those things. What Paul is getting at here, and this is the point of this verse, is there is a future aspect to our salvation. That as we who are saved persevere, as we who call ourselves Christians persist and practice these things, we will influence others to be saved meaning that God will use you and your life and your story and your testimony to influence others and to share the hope that you have to people who are lost and headed for hell. So we need to keep practicing and persevering in our walk with the Lord because eternity is at stake. When life gets hard, don't give up, keep going. And if I could be honest for just a minute, there are times when I persevere when I would rather quit. There are times when I'm like, man, it would be so much easier to go do something else. I don't want to keep doing this anymore. Let's wrap it up. It's been fun. It's been real. But you know what I'm learning as we're going through 1 Timothy? That it's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's not just about him. It's not just about her. It's about all of us. We're in this thing together. We're a family, we're a church, we're the body of Christ. And if we want to see our friends and our family and our city changed and loving Jesus, then we need to persevere. Remember, there is a finish line in our race where we'll hear the words every Christian wants to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into your rest. We all want to hear that. So let's do what Coach Paul is telling us to do. Let's stay in the game. Let's be bold, know who our God is. Let's set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity, no matter how young or inexperienced you feel. Let's read our Bibles. Let's use the gifts that God has given us. And let's keep our eyes on the prize, knowing that eternity is at stake. And if we practice these things, if we persevere together, you know what's gonna happen? God's gonna do amazing things in our church and through us, and we're gonna see people's lives changed. So let's persevere together and conquer the city for Jesus. Amen.